and thank you for coming here today, and thank you to the organizers for giving me this opportunity to come and talk here. When I was growing up, I remember looking into the night sky and thinking how beautiful all the stars and all the galaxies were. I knew I wanted to explore space, and I knew I wanted to understand the universe and how it worked. Um, well, luckily for me, I've got a job at the European Space Agency, an organization dedicated to exploring space. I work for the Euclid mission, which we're going to find out all about in this talk. But instead of looking at the brightest and the most sparkly objects in the universe, I'm actually searching for the most elusive, the most mysterious components of the universe. I look at the dark universe. And to understand where that comes from, we have to go back to the very start of the universe. So, in the very early stages of the universe, some people might know this as the Big Bang, everything was very hot and very dense. Photons and baryons were coupled together, so light and the material that makes up you and I and the things that we can see and interact with, they were coupled together in this plasma and moving in and out of the quantum fluctuations in the early universe. And as time went by, the universe expanded, because of course it was hot, and um, under the influence of gravity, the universe formed these structures. So all the gravity was making structures collapse, and the universe was expanding, creating these voids. This is what we know as the large-scale structure. This spongy, spongy texture is what we call the cosmic web. And at the, the highest density peaks of this large-scale structure lives galaxy clusters. And these are the objects that I'm most interested in my research. So galaxy clusters are the largest gravitationally bound objects in our universe. And they're very complex systems for us to study the dark universe. In fact, back in 1933, this chap, Fritz Zwicky, he's a Swiss born um, in Bulgaria, actually. And he was looking at the coma cluster of galaxy clusters, um, of galaxies, and he noticed that these galaxies were whizzing around each other way too quickly. There was not enough gravity in the galaxies themselves to keep them bound together. They should be flying off all over the place. So he said that there must be some dunkel materie keeping these objects bound together. And this was one of the first references to dark matter we have in the literature. Today, we know that galaxy clusters comprise of 1% of stars and galaxies. So this is what we can see with our visible eyes. Later, with the invent of the first X-ray telescopes, we noticed that galaxy clusters emit a large amount of hot X-ray gas, a million degrees or more. And um, unfortunately, this hot gas could only comprise of maybe 10% of the mass of a galaxy cluster. Together with the stars and galaxies, the hot gas are what make up baryons. So this is stuff that we can see with our telescopes and with our eyes. The rest of, rest of galaxy clusters, um, it's still missing. And this is what we call dark matter. 90% of the mass of galaxy clusters is missing. 90% of the mass of galaxy clusters is dark matter. And that's why I'm so interested in studying them. Today, with our um, ESA's Planck telescope, for example, we know very well how much um, dark matter and dark energy is in our universe. So in the universe as a whole, there's about 70% dark energy. This is the mysterious energy that is allowing our universe to acceleratingly expand. 5% of our universe is in baryons, so stuff that make up you and me, for example. And 25% of the mass is dark matter. So a huge amount of mass of the universe is dark matter. It should be flying through us all the time. But we can't see it, this because it doesn't emit any light. It barely interacts with anything. And we haven't been able to detect it in any of our detectors here on Earth. 
So we're really puzzled as to why. But the components of the universe are really important for cosmology. So these are the things that tell us what is the nature of a universe, how it started, how it will evolve, and how it will end. There's a good theory to describe our universe, and this is the standard model, or the Lander CDM model. And it's parameterized by a couple of parameters, for example, how much dark matter is there in the universe, how much dark energy there is in the universe, how fast our universe is expanding, um, how fast the structure is growing, um, the mass of neutrinos, how, how, uh, how distributed the fluctuations in the early universe were. And um, this is one of the things I am interested in because I am interested in understanding how the universe works. Depending on the cosmological parameters that you put in from cosmological simulations, we know that the universe looks very different. So on this screen now, you should see two different simulations with two different cosmological parameter inputs. You can see the structures clustered differently, and the size of the voids, the empty spaces, are very different depending on the cosmology. In my research to do cluster cosmology, I use the cluster mass function. So this is basically if you count the number of uh, galaxy clusters there are in the universe as a function of their mass, you get this exponentially decaying curve. And the normalization and the slope of this curve is very sensitive to the cosmological parameters. But if we can't measure the mass of galaxy clusters because we can't see dark matter, right? Well, the answer to that is gravitational lensing. So um, in gravitational lensing, if you have a faraway galaxy, the light from this galaxy um, will be perturbed as it enters the vicinity of a massive object like a galaxy cluster. Um, what I work on is weak gravitational lensing. So if you imagine lots of background galaxies very far away, perfectly circular on the sky, if I were to put a galaxy cluster in the center of, in between me and the background galaxies, we call this a lens, and basically, it perturbs the shape of the galaxies. They get tangentially perturbed towards the galaxy cluster itself. And the more mass there is in a galaxy cluster, the more these um, galax background galaxies are distorted in shape. And in strong lensing, this effect is really, really clear because you get these giant arcs on the sky, and sometimes even entire rings. Gravitational lensing is a purely geometrical effect, and its strength is dependent on two things. It's dependent on the mass of the galaxy cluster, or the mass of the lens, and this is solely sensitive to um, the growth of structure in the universe, and so the, the amount of dark matter and dark energy there is in the universe. Um, and the second thing is the distance between the observer, the source galaxy, and the lens, um, or the galaxy cluster, whatever is in between. Um, so the distances are also sensitive to the geometry of the universe. So the distance to a galaxy will be very different depending on if we have a flat universe or a curved universe. Cool. But of course we don't have any space rulers to measure the distance of a galaxy. What we have instead is an effect called redshift. So if you look at the entire spectrum um, of light. What we have is, um, at the very high energy range, we have short wavelengths, the gamma rays, and at the high energy light, we have long wavelengths. And if you imagine a galaxy who emits a light at a given wavelength, as the universe expands, this light is stretched. So the wavelength of the light is shifted to longer wavelengths. What this means is, if we can look at a galaxy and we can uh, measure its light at all different wavelengths, we can get its spectrum. But if the galaxy was further away, this spectrum is shifted to higher wavelengths and even higher wavelengths for even further away. So redshift is a measure of the distance a galaxy is from us. 
This is great. This is called spectroscopic redshifts. And this is ideal because we get very accurate distance measurements to galaxies. But unfortunately, it's also quite time consuming. It, it takes a lot of time to observe the entire spectrum of a galaxy. So quite often what we have is photometric redshifts where we can only see like in certain bands of the wavelengths. And so we get a less accurate measurement of the distance. And this is known as photometric redshifts. So for weak gravitational lensing, the other thing that's important is measuring the shapes. And I showed you earlier, it should be easy because a circular galaxy is just sheared and we just measure how much its, uh, cha its shape changes. Unfortunately, real galaxies are not perfectly circular. They're quite elliptical in shape. And the gravitational lensing causes the change in shape of a galaxy of order 1%. And if you're like me, we tend to use telescopes from the Earth. We have to see our galaxies through the atmosphere and through the telescope. So our galaxies appear blurred. And also, we get pixelization from our detectors. And of course, there's noise. And we have to measure a 1% change in the shapes of galaxies from all of this. The other really important thing is that we have this thing called point spread function. So um, stars in our images should be point-like, but in our images, they're smeared by the point spread function. And possible reasons of this is like out of focus, um, incorrect mirror alignments, um, imperfect mirrors, um, all sorts of things could cause this effect. That's fine. All we have to do is correct to make sure that all of our stars look like point sources, right? But it's not that easy, because the PSF is anisotropic. So it's not the same on all areas of our image. Secondly, it's redshift dependent. And thirdly, it's dependent on how bright an object is. So a brighter galaxy will get smeared more than an unbright object. But this is the only way that we can really see the dark universe. And our question is, what is the nature of that? dark universe. So we need to do gravitational lensing very well. And this is where Euclid comes in. Euclid is built for two main scientific purposes. The first is cosmic shear. So this is the weak gravitational lensing of the entire large-scale structure of our universe. We want to make a 3D map of where dark matter is in our universe. The second thing is something called baryonic acoustic oscillations. So if you recall, I said that photons and baryons, they were coupled together in the early universe. You can think of them like on a slinky, stuck together. And they're moving in and out of these quantum fluctuations because gravity is pulling them into the potential wells, but radiation pressure is pushing them out. But at some point, the photons and the baryons, they decouple. And depending on when they decouple and how far the peaks are away from each other when they do, leaves a very characteristic signal on our sky. If you look at the cosmic microwave background, which is a map of our universe, uh, of our universe in the very early stages, these signatures appear there. If you think of um, you have photons and baryons distributed in some sort of way, um, if you measure the distances of galaxies, you'll get this perfect circle shape and a peak in the center. So this circle is dependent on um, when the photons and baryons decoupled from each other. And the peak is because after they decouple, the baryons will fall into the potential wells of the dark matter. But in an accelerated expanding universe, you'll get a larger ring. So to me measure BAO signal, all you have to do is calculate the separation of all the galaxies in the universe and tally them up, and you'll get this very characteristic peak. And the location of this peak, its height and its width, is also sensitive to cosmology. So finally, onto Euclid. This is the Euclid telescope. It's a 1.2 meter telescope that we are sending to space. It, uh, its name comes from the Greek mathematician uh, Euclid of Alexandria. And um, its purpose is to study the dark universe, understanding 
what the geometry of the universe is, measuring the redshift distance relationship, and studying how structure grows in our universe. Euclid will measure the shapes of over a billion galaxies very, very accurately because we're in space and not on the ground anymore. And this is crucial because I told you we only get 1% changes in the shapes of galaxies, and we need to measure this, and having as many statistics as possible really improves our results. Euclid is part of the Cosmic Vision program. So this is one of ESA's initiatives running from 2015 to 2025. Um, we have three large missions costing a billion euro each, seven medium-sized missions of half a billion euro um, budget, and Euclid lies within this medium mission range, and several extra smaller missions, um, often costing less than 50 million euros. On the timeline of things, um, the first mission to go in this uh, cosmic vision program will be CHAOPS in 2019. So this is going to measure the transits of exoplanets. We're going to the Sun in 2020. In 2021, we have a joint project with the Chinese to measure the magnetic field of Earth, called SMILE, and this is one of our smaller missions. But at the same time, we hope to launch Euclid. By 2022, we hope to go to Jupiter's icy moons to see if there's any life there. PLATO is a follow-up mission of CHAOPS, so it's also looking for exoplanets from it, their transiting um, signature. In 2028, we have Athena and Ariel. Athena will make an X-ray map of the entire sky, and Ariel will also look for exoplanets, but more specifically, studying their atmospheres to see if it's similar to Earth's. In 2034, it's going to be really exciting because LISA will launch, and this will give a completely new measurement on gravitational waves just because of how stable it is out there in space. And recently, we announced um, further study of these three uh, projects, Cecius, um, a high-energy um, mission, a speaker looking at the farthest away galaxies in the infrared, and Envision possibly going to uh, Venus. Of course, there's still money for a sixth and seventh medium-sized mission, and several smaller-sized missions are possible too. On Euclid's mission timeline, Euclid was, uh, was selected before I was even, um, even in university. At that time, I don't think I even knew what dark matter or dark energy was. And it took quite a few years before the science was really defined. We have to figure out what science we're going to do with this mission before um, the mission implementation starts. And right now we're in implementation. This means that we're building test um, instruments. We're testing them out. We're refining our sciences and making sure that we meet the, um, meet the requirements that we want for the science objectives. Hopefully, we'll launch in 2021, and it has an optimal lifetime of six years. In detail, this is Euclid, and it, it consists of two components. The part at the top is the payload module, and this is being fulfilled by Airbus. Um, and the second part is the service vehicular module at the bottom, and um, this is going to be provided by Thales Space. Euclid is a 1.2 meter Korsh anti stigmat telescope. This means that its mirror is very flat and very wide, which enables us to have a very wide field view of the sky. It has three mirrors. You can see two of them there. And um, there's a human for, for size um, comparisons. This is an example from the simulations of what we'll see with Euclid. So you can see it's very, very messy. Um, you've got cosmic rays. Um, these are high-energy uh, particles in the sky. We're still not quite sure where they come from. Uh, but they actually damage our CCDs, so they're quite bad. Uh, we've got these uh, rings, donuts. They're called ghosts from stars and dust. And we need to measure accurate shapes of these galaxies. So they're quite difficult to find, obviously. Um, so what we do is we do step and stare, four divers. We move the telescope a little bit and we observe. 
we move it a bit more and we observe, and then we move it a bit more and observe. We will do four divers every hour with some sort of pattern. This hasn't been completely defined yet, but it enables to correct for things like the PSF and making sure that we really do measure the shapes of the galaxies very, very accurately. In detail, this is Euclid. We have two antennas on board, a low gain antenna to communicate with the satellite and a high gain antenna to download the data. We have 10 square meters of solar arrays, and these are for its main source of energy. We have star trackers to make sure that we're orientating in the right area of the sky. Um, we need to be very thermally stable because any changes in the temperature in the telescope will affect the noise on our images and also affect our, our ability to measure the shapes. And that's why we have several radiators um, and also a thermal baffle, which, um, which prevents any light from, for example, the sun, etc., getting into our telescope. We only want to observe the very uh, faint galaxies. Inside the telescope, inside the payload module, this is what it looks like. The light comes in through the telescope. It hits the first mirror, reflects off it to the second mirror. It hits some uh, folding mirrors before it hits the third mirror. The structure of Euclid and most of its mirrors are made out of silicon carbide. This allows it to be very, very light. And it's also designed to be isostatic. So any changes in the temperature doesn't affect the um, thermal um, structure. Uh, it doesn't affect the structure of the mirrors. Um, after hitting the third mirror, the light hits this diachroic plate. And this is really important because it um, allows near-infrared light to pass through into our first instrument, the NISP, and it reflects any visible light to enter the second scientific instrument, VIS. And this allows us to do simultaneously uh, measurements of both near-infrared and optical at the same time. So this is a 3D um, model of Euclid, and you can see the two scientific instruments, uh, VIS and NISP, there. Uh, another important component of the telescope is the readout shutter, and this controls the amount of light entering the telescope. VIS in detail. VIS is a visible imager, so we see the shapes of galaxies, we measure the shapes of galaxies with VIS. It's a 36 CCD instrument, 6 by 6, uh, 4K by 4K pixels each, um, with a 0.1 arc second uh, resolution. This instrument is led by the UK, MS MSSL. Um, and here you can see one of the individual CCDs. These CCDs are tailor-made, and they're made to be very highly efficient um, and good tolerance to radiation. So like I said, you have these high energy cosmic rays hitting your CCD that are gonna damage it over time, right? Each of these CCD um, detectors have 16 megapixel resolution and the combined um, image is about 610 megapixels. This is the second largest camera that we will send to space, only beaten by ESA's Gaia mission, which is looking at the proper motion, the movements of stars in our solar system. We have calibration units on each of our instruments. This is the VIS calibration unit. And we always make a thermal model, which we can test in, for example, in this image, you can see it in an oven, and we're baking it to make sure that it's very stable in thermal conditions, thermal changes. Um, and we also make an electronical model to test the electronics. Uh, the calibration unit is for flat fielding. So basically, inside, there's several LEDs that um, shine an even illumination on our CCD so that we can figure out if there's any variations from pixel to pixel or if there's any defects in, um, in the imaging. And this also has the readout shutter, like I said. And this controls the amount of light entering, and, um, entering our CCD. It's also for calibration, so sometimes we want to take images with no light at all to test how the electronical um, 
noise affects our images. And sometimes we want to take zero exposures to check all the uh, pixels are working, etc. This has to open and close over a million times in space. And we can't go to fix it once it's in space. So we need to make sure that it really works before we send it up there. Um, this has been really difficult, actually, because every time this opens and closes, it creates this torque. So the whole telescope is moving around. And we need very, very accurate shape measurements. So we need to keep the telescope as still as possible. To give you an idea of the field of view that, that Euclid will see, this is the moon. It has a 0.2 square degree area on the sky. Hubble Space Telescope is tiny. It's like a fraction of the moon's area. Euclid, on the other hand, will cover about half a square degree uh, over twice the area of the moon. It would take Hubble a thousand years to cover the same area that Euclid will do in its six years' lifetime. The second instrument on Euclid is called NIST. It's the Near Infrared Spectrometer and Photometer. So it looks in near infrared wavelengths. This is where the light from the farthest away galaxies, their light peaks at this wavelength. And Basically, what it does, it's, it's going to give us very accurate spectroscopic redshifts and photometric redshifts. So um, remember, redshift is equivalent to distance. It's going to measure the distances of galaxies. This is led by the French. And in the image on the very left-hand side, you see the filters. The gold thing is a calibration unit. And the right-hand side is the focal plane of the detector. In detail, this is th one of the individual detectors. And uh, there's 16 of these in total. Um, these detectors are so advanced that we could not make them here in Europe. The technology only is, exists in the US. So it was developed in conjunction with NASA and a US company um, to create. Each of them are four megapixels um, in resolution. And you can see the calibration unit um, in embedded in the image there as well. And like the VIS calibration unit, it's for flat fielding. So it has LEDs um, inside. So for the photometric redshifts, we have photometric filters. And these live on a reaction wheel. Um, there's three filters built in into Euclid's uh, photometric wheel. And uh, Y, J, and H are just the individual bands that they will observe. Euclid's filters are 130 millimeters in diameter. So these are going to be the largest filters that we've ever sent to space. And in the image um, shown are just some demonstrations of a 40 millimeter up to a 140 millimeter for testing purposes. For the, uh, for the spectroscopy, um, what we have is a grism. So this is a cross between a grating and a prism. And the idea is that when light comes in, it will be split into its different wavelengths, into the entire spectrum. Again, the uh, grisms lie on a filter wheel. And there's two types on Euclid. There's a blue grism, which is um, really high resolution, enables, uh, enabling us to get the very, very high um, distances of galaxies. And then three red grisms, which are um, orientated in different directions. And you'll find out why in the next slide. But basically, this is going to give us um, the distances of galaxies. So Euclid, unlike traditional um, spectroscopy, is slitless. So in traditional spectroscopy, what you do is you know where the galaxies that you're looking for are in the sky. So you make a mask. A mask is just like a plate or something. And you do slits on where the galaxies are that you're interested in. And you place this uh, mask over your image. And as the light comes through, it will be dispersed as it, it um, comes through these slits. And this is very inefficient. And we can't do this in space, right? Um, so on the left image, what you have is the photometry that NIST will get. This is W first, but it's just a simulation. Um, and on the right is the slitless spectroscopy. So basically, you smear the light of every single galaxy in your image into its spectra. 
And you can see why this is quite difficult, because all the galaxies are very difficult to um, figure out which, which spectroscopy comes from which galaxy, and figuring like, out how to deal with overlapping spectra. And that's why you need these rotations, because then you can disentangle it all. And um, like the um, readout shitter on this, NIST has cryomotors to turn and change the different filters that you're working in. And again, these have to work over a million times, so we need to make sure that they work really, really well. Euclid will launch in 2021 somewhere from Europe, possibly in Cannes, France, when it, where it will be assembled, to French Guiana Kourou. And this is ESA's only spaceport. Um, and it's an ideal site, really, because it's by the sea, so if any um, debris falls, um, it will hit the sea and not any inhabited area on the, s on the Earth. And also, it's close to the equator, so you get the boost of the Earth's rotation to help us get into space. It will launch on a rocket similar to this one. This is the Soyuz ST2.1b. And this has a launch capacity of about 2,000 kilograms, which really sets the upper limits on what we can send to space. It's really important to test um, for vib uh, vibroacoustic oscillations and stuff from this, because if any dust or uh, debris falls when the fairing detaches, it's going to land on our mirror and affect our ability to measure galaxy shapes. But after that, about 30 days later, hopefully, we will get to um, the Earth-Sun Lagrange point two. This is one of the most stable places in our solar system, and it's low radiation. And uh, Euclid will go there, where it will be orientated with the solar panels facing about 30 degrees from the sun, so it's not going to get too hot, and it's also going to get enough energy. The propellant for this, uh, mostly it's hydrazine. And um, hydrazine will enable us to do the big slews. This is a very common um, monopropellant, so it doesn't need oxygen to combine it. So it's a very simple mechanism, and it's quite often used. But for the very, very small, small movements, we use cold gas. So these cold gas microthrusters enable us to be as still as possible in case any like micrometeorites hit us, for example, we need to stay still. It's not new technology either. SpaceX use it in their Falcon 9, and you can see that on the right-hand side. Um, and actually, it's a heritage from ESA's uh, Gaia mission. This will offer us seven years of fuel. Once we're in space, we need to communicate to Earth, and that's what ESA's Deep Space Tracking Network's for. We have three, one in New Norcia in Australia, um, the second in um, Sobreros in Madrid, close to Madrid, and the third in Malague in Argentina. And this uh, will be communicating with uh, ESA's ESOC uh, center in Darmstadt. This is Missions Operations Center. The main communications will be with the Sobreros um, antenna. It's a 35-meter dish about 80 kilometers from Madrid. And every day, we'll be able to talk to the telescope for four, four hours. And um, we, like I said, there's a high-gain antenna for the data download. And this is steerable to make sure that we can communicate with it at most times. And a low-gain antenna to do the day-to-day -day communications and telemetry editing it's, and commanding of the spacecraft. Um, this is where I work. This is the European Space Astronomy Center in Madrid. And it's an ex-telemetry uh, and tracking and commanding station. So it still does some of that here now. But mostly, it's the home of all the astronomy and planetary missions. And there, we do the downlinking. Um, uh, there, we uh, do the archiving of the data and processing it um, to the uh, community. Here, we'll have to deal with about 10 petabytes of raw space data. And um, after 26 months after launch, we should be able to distribute this to the community. Um, ESAC's also the home to the SOC, which is what I'm part of, the Science Operations Center. And they're the interface between the Missions Operations Center in Darmstadt and the Euclid Consortium, who will process the science, who will do the science for us. 
Right now, what we do is survey planning. We're preparing for the mission, doing like budgets and uh, deadlines and things like that, making sure the software is ready. Um, but after launch, they're responsible for the downlink of the data, um, doing the daily reports, doing quick look analysis to make sure the data's okay, and then um, eventually the archiving as well. Euclid has a six-year lifetime and um, a four terabyte of flash memory. So if we can't um, communicate with the satellite, we can still um, have enough um, storage for about three days' worth of data on board. For science, we have the wide survey. So Euclid will see the entire extragalactic sky, 150 um, 15,000 square degrees, and um, this is much larger than anything we've done on Earth. We typically have uh, gravitational lensing surveys of about 200 square degrees. It's going quite deep. We're going to get 30 galaxies per arc minute squared, which is double the amount of what we get here on Earth at the moment. And we avoid the ecliptic plane because um, of zodiacal light and dust. It will also do some uh, deep survey regions, three of them, North Ecliptic Pole, South Ecliptic Pole, and the Lockman Hole, where we have lots of multi-wavelength data. This is going to go two magnitudes deeper and mostly for calibration purposes. But of course, all this data alone is not enough. To get what we want to do, we need synergies with ground-based telescopes. So we need to follow up with things like PANSTARS, CFHT, to get galaxy co colors, spectroscopy, redshifts, galaxy shapes, and calibrate them, make sure that we are measuring them correct. We're going to be supported by LSST, which will launch in 2023. This is an amazing telescope, by the way, because it's going to image the entire sky every three days. And also SKA, which is another weak lensing mission, but using the radio. It's really important to stress that the external data in Euclid is going to be much, much larger than the internal data. So LSST will be getting 15 terabytes of data a day, whereas SKA will be having like three terabytes of data per second. So we need to figure out how to deal with this big data before it comes up. We also have the largest flagship simulations. And um, these are run on the Swiss supercomputer. And it costs like 270,000 euros just to run it each time. So it's a huge amount of money to be played with. So the pe people who will deal with this is the Euclid Consortium. It's about 1,500 scientists and engineers from 15 different countries in the US and in Europe. And they're responsible for processing the scientific data and producing scientific results. These are the kind of people involved. This is the largest collaboration in astronomy. And we work on all different types of sciences. Um, this is an image from one of our uh, collaboration meetings. So you can see, like, most people aren't even there, and we fill up all this room. Um, we're not just doing weak gravitational lensing. We're going to do galaxy clusters. We're going to do solar system science. I'm actually working on a project to detect asteroids with Euclid. Um, we're going to do theory. We're going to do supernova. There's so much science to be done with this telescope. And to sum it up, I guess, this is what Euclid is going to do. You have the telescope. It's going to give us data to the ground stations, so the deep tracking networks. Um, we'll have some iteration with the Missions Operations Center in Darmstadt. Um, this will pass on the information to the Science Operations Center, which is me in Madrid, who will produce an archive full of all the data that's ready to go for science processing by the Euclid Consortium. After this, though, we'll create a compressed archive, which will be about 10 times smaller than what the Euclid Consortium use, which will be available to the general public. 
it's a very challenging task because we want to measure the cosmological parameters to less than 1% accuracy. This means that we need a very stable pointing of our telescope. In fact, so stable that it's less than the resolution of our CCDs. We need very accurate shape measurements, the ellipticities of our galaxies, less than a percentage or so. It's equivalent to, say, if I was standing 10 meters away from a grain of sand and measuring the grain of sand shape to less than 1% accuracy. It's hella difficult. And we need to know the PSF really, really well because this really, really messes up our results. And then after all of this data, of course, we've got like 20, 30, maybe 40 petabytes of data to work with. And this, this is very game-changing in astronomy because we've never worked with so much data before. But after all of that, hopefully, we're going to get so many galaxy shapes. I'm really excited for this because I've never worked with so many galaxy shapes. I'm always like, oh, we don't have enough galaxies. Um, we're going to have distances to galaxies very, very accurately because we have spectroscopic redshifts. We have 60,000 galaxy clusters. I'm working on samples of around 30 or 50 or so. So this is going to be amazing for me. And so I'm just going to leave you there. I hope you enjoyed this talk, um, and thank you for your attention. <laughs>